So just to get started, let me just, uh, I'm going to take from my notes here. So um, again, to introduce myself, my name is Kathy Schaefer. I am an engineer with FEMA. My role in this is to produce and oversee the production of the FEMA flood insurance rate maps. Uh, we'll talk about the technical data that goes into that a little bit tonight, and uh, we'll talk about the, the process. I'm joined this evening by my colleague, Michael Hornick. Uh, Michael is uh, in the back helping a gentleman. Michael uh, is a natural hazards program specialist. Michael, raise your hand, thank you. Um, if you have a question about what these maps mean to you by way of building requirements, uh, are these maps going to require that you elevate your home? Under what conditions? What, how do you flood proof? Those kinds of things. Michael is the person to answer those questions. And it, at the conclusion, he'll be standing up here toward the front. I'm also joined this evening by Edie Lohman. Uh, Edie is in the back with the tan. Uh, she's our insurance liaison. And uh, I always love having Edie with me because Edie takes all the really hard questions and I get all the easy ones. So. Uh, but she's really, really knowledgeable and, and uh, has been doing it for a number of years. And uh, she'll be standing up here toward the front to answer your specific uh, insurance questions. And then I'm also joined this evening by Olivia Humalde. Olivia is with our Public Affairs Department and she's gonna be helping to uh, compile the cards. And uh, if we wanna have some special questions with Mike, she'll be handling that. Um, and then uh, I don't know, I think we have some, uh, some folks who are with the staff of some of the communities. Can I get a show of hands of, of uh, staffers? And, uh, and so we do have some staff from Corte Madeira, we have some staff from Tiburon, uh, Mill Valley is in the back, and then we have the county, Berenice Davidson <laughs> is in the back. Did I get out all the staffers? They are with the county or the city. Um, and I'll talk about the relationship that we have in, in just a moment. Do I have any elected officials with me? Any mayors, city council members, board of supervisors? Okay. They've all chosen to avoid very contentious issues. Okay. Um, so uh, just a little bit about the National Flood Insurance Program. The reason, uh, sir, yes. Oh, thank you, sir. Thank you. And your name is? Robert Thank you, Robert. Thank you. Uh, uh, Robert Ber Berman? Burton. Burton. Thank you, Robert Bur Rob Bert Burton. I'm with the director of Richardson Bay Sanitary District. Okay, we have a, a, a director of the Richardson Bay Sanitary Tenant District. Terrific. Thank you. I, I love having elected officials. Okay, so uh, a little bit about the National Flood Insurance Program. Uh, the National Flood Insurance Program was uh, enacted in 1968. Uh, it was enacted in response to some major flood disasters when there was the realization that the private sector uh, had gotten out of the flood insurance business. So, uh, so the federal government uh, decided, or we the people decided that we should at least have some protection, some way to recover from, uh, from flood losses, and they enacted the National Flood Insurance Program. Uh, it has three parts to it. Uh, it starts with the flood insurance rate maps, uh, the ones that are in the back of the room, the ones I'm responsible for producing. And these maps show areas of high, moderate, and low flood risk. Uh, zone A or a V is considered a high flood risk. So anyone, if you are in a zone A or a V, uh, that is a high risk area. A shaded zone X is considered a moderate flood risk. Flood insurance and building requirements uh, are not required in shaded zone X. And then a low flood risk is a, a, an unshaded zone X. Uh, so there's um, so anything that starts with an A or a V uh, is a high flood risk area, and uh, you are required to buy flood insurance if you have a federally backed mortgage, and you will have some building requirements if you uh, want to build a new structure. 
B as in Victor, yes sir, yes sir. B as in Victor and A as in Alpha. Anything that starts with an A or a B and Alpha. Uh, since we're talking about that, the difference between an A zone and a B zone is that an A zone is generally used in uh, riverine or in areas where the wave height is less than three feet. So most of the Mill Valley area, the, uh, the San Rafael, Larkspur area, those are all A zones because as you would expect, we don't have really high waves uh, that would impact the shoreline. We do have a few areas in Marin near Tiburon and uh, Sausalito uh, where the wave height is greater than three feet and so they are in a V zone. And that's what you would expect, that the waves coming through the Golden Gate hit uh, certain uh, parts of Sausalito and Tiburon. Uh, so, and, and there might be a few in Mill Valley depending on the orientation, correct? Yes, ma'am. Um, so I was saying that we have the maps and we give those maps to the community and we ask the community to adopt them and use them uh, to encourage residents to build wisely in the floodplain. And then in exchange for adopting a FEMA map, so the, there's an ordinance, your community has an ordinance that says that they formally adopt the map and agree to use them in building uh, permits when they issue building permits. Um, and in exchange for that, FEMA provides flood insurance to anyone and everyone who wants that. So flood insurance is available to everyone regardless of where you are uh, and uh, so that it is available to everyone. So that's the, that's the arrangement. A lot of people kind of wonder, well where does the flood insurance money come from? Is it, does it come from the general fund of the government? How is it you know, that I go to my insurance agent? The, uh, National Flood Insurance Program is a standalone program and the way that the uh, uh, premiums are calculated is that on an average flood year, the amount of money coming into the pot is supposed to equal the amount of money that goes out of the pot. That's the sort of the plan uh, and the rates are set by Congress. Uh, we, we, your local officials are the ones who establish those rates. Um, as a rule, uh, money uh, from the, the general fund does not go into the flood insurance program. Uh, and uh, if we do borrow money from the federal government for the program, they pay it back with interest. Uh, and we, unfortunately though, we have had a number of very large disasters in the recent past and uh, the flood insurance program is, has a debt and that's being debated at Congress. And we're not gonna talk about that tonight. I'll leave that to you to talk with your elected officials about if you have any concerns. But when, we, when you get uh, a, a flood insurance or you buy it generally through your local insurance agent and Edie will talk with that. But it's just an arrangement that we have with the insurance agents to allow them to sell that. Uh, sort of a pass-through thing that they do. Uh, tonight we'll talk a little bit about a base flood elevation. And, and uh, for all of you who uh, know your blood pressure, your BP, you now have a new number to learn and that is your BFE, base flood elevation. The base flood elevation is the elevation that is estimated to, uh, the, the elevation of the flood waters that have a 1% annual chance of occurring. And I have some uh, uh, flyers in the back uh, that talk about statistics and about the 1% chance. And I have in here, the way to look at it is, I have in here um, 100 rocks. And buried deep in here somewhere is a red rock. And the way to think about this 1% chance uh, concept is to imagine that Mother Nature has a jar like this on her shelf. She has one for flood, she has one for earthquake, she has one for fire, one for tsunami, one for drought. And each year she picks one out and she opens up the jar and picks out a rock and looks at it. And if it's a black rock, 
she goes, well, that's kind of boring. Let me see if I can have more fun with a drought or a fire. Um, but if perchance she reaches in and gets a red rock, the one red rock that's in here, then voila, she's going to give us a uh, flood this year. Um, and conceptually, or the statistics are that um, the uh, 1906 earthquake is considered by seismologists to be a 1% annual chance earthquake. So the, they're sort of the same, uh, and so I often refer to the flood, the 1% annual chance flood as the big one. So a lot of folks will say, I haven't flooded in 30 years. That is because Mother Nature has reached in here 30 times and not yet pulled out the red rock that exists. Um, so, uh, so again, your base flood elevation uh, is the elevation that the water, the floodwaters will get to if, when the big one happens. And uh, the other number that you need to know or need to kind of understand is uh, the lowest adjacent grave, the elevation of the lowest adjacent grave. And the lowest adjacent grade is if you walk around the, the corner of your house, and just as the name implies, if there is a low spot in one corner of your house or one part of the dirt next to your house, it is that elevation that is important. So let's, for example, assume that this table is your house, and, and uh, the lowest adjacent grade might be the floor right here, and the, and the base flood elevation might be the water surface that would top the water, then in that case, you would be required to buy flood insurance because the water is higher than the, the uh, base flood elevation. If it were reversed, if this was the elevation of the base flood and this was the elevation of the ground, uh, the lowest adjacent grade, then you could apply for a LOMA and you would be removed from the requirement to buy flood insurance. So we'll talk more about that. I don't want to, but we'll come back to that. I just want to touch on that. Um, so a little bit about the new study that we're doing and kind of why we're having this meeting tonight. Um, we are doing a new study of the in San Francisco Bay. We are studying the entire San Francisco Bay from San Pablo all the way down to San Jose. This is the first time that we have had the computing power to be able to do that. So that in large part, that is why we are doing it. The other reason that we are doing it is that we were mandated in con by Congress in 2012 to study and update the maps for 100% of the populated coast. So uh, this, uh, we are studying not only the San Francisco Bay and San Pablo Bay, but I have a colleague who is working on new studies for the entire California coast. So your friends and neighbors who live in Bolinas, they will be attending these same meetings in about two years. Uh, the study that we're doing, it consists of a number of pieces. Um, and actually, I want to also note that the study, the reason we're doing is the old maps are, the study information is old and outdated. It was created in the 1980s, and if you think about the technology that you used in the 1980s and the technology that you use today, you can understand uh, why we uh, are uh, updating the maps. Um, the, the new study uh, uses a number of uh, pieces uh, that come together. We uh, used very uh, technical data, uh, and we uh, have, we collected bathymetry, which is the elevation of the uh, ground below the water surface uh, uh, of the bay. We collected LIDAR data, which is, uh, uses the same technology as policemen use to, to calculate your speed. Uh, they employ that from a, an airport, airplane, and they use it to estimate distance. It's, it's very accurate, allows us to get ground surface elevations to within about a foot or half a foot. So we have this uh, topographic information. With that, we then uh, overlaid or created a computer model, a two-dimensional computer model uh, using technology from the Danish Hydraulics Institute. Uh, and we model the wave and the surge 
and the swells, which are the long waves that come in under the bay. Uh, we modeled that, the bay uh, for 31 years. Every hour for 31 years, uh, we call it a 31-year hindcast model. And uh, um, then from that model, we uh, extracted at 8,000 points around the bay, we extracted that hour by hour information and then performed a statistical analysis on those points. And that is how we came up with what we call the 1% annual still water elevation. With that information, then we then overlaid and did an analysis by cutting one-dimensional transects and we uh, evaluated the wave and the wave runup. And the combination of the two is what establishes the base flood elevation for the different points around the bay. And a lot of this, uh, this information, I have it on a website called, uh, that you can go to at, called R9MAP, R as the letter R, 9, because we're part of Region 9, r9map.org. So uh, for more information, and I can share that with you at, at the end of the, the meeting. But for those of you who want to get the technical stuff, I'll be available in the back and we'll talk more about the technical aspects of the, of the study. Yes, yes ma'am. Have those been posted? Because I went there not long ago and there, the, this area wasn't posted. It, it, um, the, yeah, the woman wants to know if the maps were posted. Um, and I'll, let, me, let me come back to that question. That's a great question. Let me come back to that. So, um, yes? What was the first year of the 31-year high cap? I knew somebody was going to ask me that question. I don't remember it off the top of my head, but I, there's some uh, frequently asked questions, and I have it in here. Uh, it was, well, I'll ask me in a minute, but it's, it's okay. in the fact sheet here. Um, so we created this model, we did the wave run-up, and then we mapped the information. And so then the, the FEMA mapping process uh, is by design very slow and deliberate. And it takes a, a while. We go through a very formal process. So we created work maps. We shared those work maps with your community officials, your uh, planners and your uh, public works uh, folks and we uh, asked them to comment on them, and they did so. They hired uh, the firm of Stetson Engineering to review our work, uh, and uh, our consultants uh, also have an independent QA, QC process. So these maps and the data have been independently reviewed twice uh, and, and to confirm the, the quality of the data. And uh, once we... Uh, uh, present them uh, to work maps, then we convert them to the official FEMA map that you see um, in the back of the room and the digital product that uh, our, the uh, marinmap.org has used to create a really great website. So those are the preliminary maps, what we call preliminary maps. Uh, they're uh, for comment and review. Once we issue the preliminary maps, then we provide an opportunity for every, anyone and everyone to provide better technical data or to uh, dispute the maps. We have a 90-day appeal period. We're in the middle of that 90-day appeal period. It started on June 4th and will go for 90 days. Um, if you wish to submit an appeal, um, it has to be based on better technical data can't be that I don't like this map. You can submit that comment, but if you, uh, uh, you know, want to dispute the map, it must be provided with technical data. 1973. Uh, uh, so that's technical data. Um, and then uh, we will um, resolve any appeals and comments and then issue what's known as a letter of final determination and the letter of final determination is a letter that we send to your elected official, to your mayor or city council members, and that is the first time that everyone will know exactly when the new maps will become effective. 
And that letter of final determination is anticipated to be sent to your mayor or the chairman of the board of supervisors in uh, spring of next year. Once they receive the letter of final determination, then the new maps will become effective exactly six months from the date of the letter of final determination. So at this time, we are projecting that the new maps that come with the, with the study um, will be effective in uh, September-ish of next year. 20. So there's a lot of time. We'll have a lot of discussions, I'm sure. You'll have plenty of opportunity to reach out to your uh, community to understand what this means to you and uh, to answer any of the questions you may have. Uh, one of the points I want to make before uh, kind of closing or opening this up to questions is that um, we went through and, and create, uh, went through a lot of work and effort and scientific information to create these maps. And it's important that, to me, that, that you know that we didn't just take a crayon and draw a boundary, that we actually put a lot of thought and effort into it. But as we look at the maps, um, it, the reality is that we probably could have used a crayon because if you look at old ortho photos of the San Francisco Bay, what these maps are showing is that Mother Nature, when the big one happens, when her version of the flood big one occurs, Mother Nature will take back the land she occupied in 1930. So if you are, uh, if your home is on some sort of fill or some sort of um, uh, land that it, prior to 1930 was part of the bay, chances are you are in a high flood risk area. And if you want a really good picture of that, and for those of you, if you, uh, there is a, a kind of an interesting picture, those of you who may shop at the Trader Joe's in, uh, in Corte Madeira, uh, next time you're at Trader Joe's, I encourage you to go to the back to the, where the restrooms are. They have a picture of, of uh, Corte Madeira uh, in the 50s or 60s when Trader Joe's, when that development was being uh, constructed. And, and you can see how they are filling in the bay, and you can see kind of where the fill is, and then if you look at the FEMA map for that area, you'll see where you, as a, as a homeowner, you would draw the line if it were up to you. Uh, so, so that is uh, kind of the, uh, the story. It's Mother Nature will take back the land she occupied. Uh, and the other thing about the study that we're seeing is that uh, the, the base flood elevations are going up about a foot. The reason for that is that the old study was based on a Corps of Engineers study that really took into account, and the big storm event is the storm event of, of, uh, of uh, 1983. Uh, and the old maps were based on that storm event and they considered the still water elevation only. The new maps and the new process that we use adds that wave run-up component, and it's that wave run-up that adds about a foot to the base flood elevation. So I'll be answering your questions here in just a minute. Um, so uh, some, some places for you to go for some resources um, for information that we would strongly encourage you to, to go to. We have a, a website for homeowners called floodsmart.gov. I think you, many of you may have seen those commercials that come on TV occasionally, floodsmart.gov. They have really lots of resources, lots of information for you to find out about what your rates may be, how to calculate your rates, um, and what this all sort of means to you. We have another, uh, another access, we have 1877 FEMA map. You can uh, pick up the phone and call a map specialist, 1-877-FEMA-MAP. And uh, the County of Marin has done just a spectacular job of taking the, the digital data that we're providing and creating a website so that you can uh, zoom and pan and, and really get into your parcel. And so marinmap.org, 
It's really pretty easy to use. It works on your iPhone. Uh, as we've been having these meetings, a number of folks have been coming up with their iPhone and showing me their, their parcel. Uh, it's a really great resource. So uh, those are the key. The other parts are that these maps belong to your community. Uh, and so if you have questions, really one of the best places also for you to go is with your local uh, staff. You all have a floodplain administrator, and it's their job to help answer these questions, so many of these questions for you. And they're really terrific uh, in that. Sir? To what extent do these maps take into account climate change? To what extent that these, and that's a great question, we'll have more of these in a minute, but these, the FEMA maps are uh, for the purposes of administering the National Flood Insurance Program. So these maps reflect the existing conditions today. They do not include a climate change or the potential for climate change. So if you are making decisions about whether or not you want to elevate your home or do something, you will want to add in some element uh, that may consider climate change. So that is the, I think, most of the uh, things I wanted to cover with you. Again, the schedule is that these new maps will become effective uh, in the fall of 2012. So I'm going to turn it over. I'm sorry, 2012, 2015, sorry. Uh, fall of 2015. Uh, so I'm going to give Edie just a few minutes to talk, to talk just in very general. Actually, there is one other thing I wanted to talk about and I forgot. Um, a lot of people ask the question, how do I uh, ensure that I'm paying the lowest rate or how do I get out if I'm eligible to get out of the flood zone? Um, what is the process? So there's a tier, if you kind of start with the easiest and work to the downward and to see, kind of go through a process. So uh, for, for homes that may be right on the edge, you know, the line is like right here and this is your house. And, and maybe it just, it, you know, when you look at the big scale, it looks like it might be and then when you zoom in, it's not quite there. Then you have an option that we call the out as shown Loma. And it's just as the name applies, is that if when you zoom in or you look at the map, your structure, maybe it goes through your parcel, but it doesn't touch your structure, um, but you may have been required or been asked to pay flood insurance, you can request an out as shown Loma. And the best and easiest process for doing that is to just call 1-877-FEMA-MAP and they'll walk you through the process. Uh, Bernice Davidson, if you're in the county or some of your city staff, can also help you provide the maps and walk you through the process. So if that doesn't work, if the line actually then cuts through your house, it, that is because the ground, uh, as we understand it from our LIDAR technology, is that the ground is lower than the uh, base flood elevation. But sometimes if you're really, really close, the resolution of our LIDAR data is such that um, we may not pick up that little nuance that is there. And so the next step for you then is to apply or think about applying for a letter of map amendment, a LOMA, L-O-M-A. And a letter of map amendment, you have to demonstrate that the lowest adjacent grade is above the base flood elevation. And uh, you can, uh, I would encourage you, if you're close, to talk to your city staff and to get, or call 1-877-FEMA-MAP. We have an online system, and uh, uh, sometimes you can submit uh, some data that, that makes it fairly easy. Most frequently, you will be asked to get an elevation certificate. An elevation certificate is a, a, a document that is prepared by a licensed professional surveyor. And the licensed surveyor surveys the elevation of the ground and, the elevate, and knows the elevation of the flood and then certifies that your lowest adjacent grade is above the base flood elevation 
And with that document, you are eligible to get a letter of mouth amendment. There's a number of folks that have those. Uh, and many times, you know, you, you may even have a neighbor that has gone through that. Uh, then uh, sometimes, uh, you know, you truly are in a high-risk flood zone. There's just kind of no getting around it. But perhaps you have an older home that was built on a stem wall and has adequate venting. Then uh, sometimes, depending on your particular situation, and Edie can often help you with that, or your local uh, staff or folks at 1877 FEMA Math, you can make a determination that it may be beneficial for you to get an elevation certificate and then have your insurance rated according to the elevation certificate. So if your first floor is above the base flood elevation, you will pay less in flood insurance than if your first floor is below the, flood, the base flood elevation. If your lowest adjacent grade is below the base flood elevation, you will be required to buy flood insurance if you have a federally backed mortgage, but if your first floor is above, there may be an opportunity for you to lower your cost for your flood insurance. So, um, so we're gonna we're asked we've uh, got everyone has uh, cards. Did everyone get a card that they one has a question? Are we all kind of got some there? Okay, so I'm gonna have Evie uh, uh, come up here to the front and just give a few little comments. And then what we'll do is we'll uh, 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 collect all the cards. And uh, while Edie's uh, doing that, giving a little talk, then I will, I and Olivia will kind of sort them into groups and we'll try to answer all those questions. Good evening, everybody. I'm gonna stand over here because the sun's coming right in uh, on top of me. So uh, welcome to the meeting tonight. And uh, we are so, it's a pleasure to be here, and we really do, as Kathy said, appreciate your time because it's a beautiful evening, and we know that you have a lot of things that you'd probably rather be doing. Uh, basically, what I'd like to do is, um, Kathy said a lot about the flood insurance. We, uh, it can be very complicated. Um, I just want to introduce myself. My name is Edie Lohman, and I work with Kathy and Olivia at FEMA Region 9. I am the flood insurance specialist. So if you have questions about flood insurance tonight, I'll be happy to try and address those um, for you or point you in the right direction. Uh, how many of you have flood insurance policies already? Okay, so quite a few of you already have flood insurance policies, so you probably know about the, the flood insurance program. Um, just a few basic items. Um, that you might want to be aware of, and, and Kathy did mention some of these, but um, currently uh, the National Flood Insurance Program is uh, undergoing some of the most major reforms we've seen in its 46 year history. And you've probably read about a lot of that legislation um, in the news. Uh, so uh, that is still being evaluated with the the most recent piece of legislation, the Homeowner Flood Insurance Portability Act, being just passed uh, by Congress on March 21st of this year. Um, so there are provisions in that legislation that will impact uh, every part of the National Flood Insurance Program, including how we do our rating for uh, structures. And uh, so we will be back to talk to you in a little bit more detail um, as these maps get closer to the effective date in the fall of 2015 uh, to talk in more specifics uh, about the insurance. Uh, but just a few highlights. Um, for those of you that have residential structures, you can purchase up to $250,000 on your residential building and up to $100,000 for personal contents. If you have a commercial building, you can purchase up to a maximum of $500,000 on your building and up to $500,000 for uh, contents on a commercial building. Uh, as Kathy mentioned, uh, pursuant to the Flood Disaster Protection Act of 73 and um, amendments, uh, if you have a federally backed loan uh, with your lender, 
and your structures located in any type of an A zone is in Adam or B zone is in Victor, uh, your lender will be required under the federal law to, to document that you have flood insurance uh, on your building and any contents in the building that are being held as collateral on the loan. So contents usually only comes into play when we have uh, business equipment in a business building that's in a floodplain that has a federally backed loan. Generally speaking, um, they're not taking personal uh, contents uh, in a residence or a single family home as collateral for the loan. Um, so that's kind of how that works. Uh, you can purchase flood insurance for those of you that do not have it or are interested in finding out about flood insurance through your local insurance agent. Um, the National Flood Insurance Program doesn't have a 1-800 number that you can call and get a policy issued. Uh, all of the flood insurance policies, uh, we get those out to the general public through licensed insurance agents. Any insurance agent in good standing with, the, with their uh, respective department of insurance can write a policy for flood uh, through the National Flood Insurance Program. If you don't have an insurance agent uh, to write you a National Flood Insurance Program policy, then what I recommend is going to floodsmart.gov and uh, you can type in your property address and it will bring up a list of agents who are flood trained on the National Flood Insurance Program. Uh, and, and so one of the reasons why we're here uh, tonight is for you to get a peek at the maps uh, that are gonna be going effective in uh, the fall of 2015. And that's key for those of you that have flood insurance questions as to you know, how is that gonna impact my flood insurance. So uh, watching the time and being considerate that we have uh, a lot of people here with a lot of great questions, uh, I'm gonna sign off and we will answer general questions. If you have a building specific question, please save that uh, for uh, later and we'll be breaking up into groups and then we can help you kind of individually. You hear me? Okay. These are really, really great questions. Thank you all. This, these are tough questions, but they're, they're really good questions. So, um, first question is, um, what is a flood zone and who makes the determination? So there's, there's sort of two pieces to that question. What is a FEMA flood zone? As I mentioned, we have uh, A and V zones, which are high risk flood zones. We have shaded zone X and we have X. So an A zone is a zone where the base flood elevation is higher than one foot above the ground. Uh, if it's less than one foot, it is a, a shaded zone X. So it has to be higher than one foot above the ground. And again, we make that determination by looking at the contour interval and the contour topographic data with our modeling and uh, scientific data. Uh, and then uh, who makes that determination? I think what you're asking is who determines or says that my home is in a flood zone? Uh, when the FEMA maps are issued, uh, the lenders are required by law to require you to buy flood insurance if they issue you a federally backed mortgage. And uh, what they do is they hire map determination companies to review the maps and make that determination. So there is a professional company that that's what they do. They look at our maps and then make the determination that your structure, not your parcel, your structure is in a flood zone and then send you the note that you need to uh, require flood insurance. Um, the other one is who's responsible to raise the base flood elevation? And uh, um, I think the, the question that you're asking is, um, how can we, uh, can we do something structurally to um, kind of remove or, or protect us from the, flood from the flooding? 
There are some measures, but I'll be honest with you, around the Bay, it's a real challenge. Um, what they do in the Central Valley is they build levees and, and then you know the homes behind the levees, the levees certified, are removed from the requirement. That's a, a lot more challenging thing when you're right up against the bay and we don't have any real easy answers, but I do start to see a lot of dialogue about looking at some solutions. So um, there's nothing quick and easy and there certainly isn't anything cheap. Uh, perhaps the best way is to elevate your home. And then again, how does a local agency provide better technical data needed for a, a LOMA? And, and the technical data that you need for a LOMA is an elevation certificate. That's the cleanest way, it's the most expensive way, but it is the, the most expedient. And as I mentioned, if you uh, want to try for a LOMA, uh, there are some things you can do first and contact 1-877-FEMA-MAP or your local community to see if they can um, walk you through the process. Um, how are the maps, uh, oh, how do the maps today compare with those that went into effect in March of 2014? That is a really good question for Marin, for Mill Valley residents. Um, we did a study uh, of the uh, Corda, Madeira, Arroyo, Del Prado Creek, uh, along with the Ross Valley Creek through uh, the town of Ross, San Anselmo, and Fairfax. It was a riverine study as opposed to the coastal study that I'm talking about today. That study, uh, that uh, study went into effect in March of 2014. So if, as a consequence of the updating of the Riverine study, uh, your status changed, uh, you may be impacted by new maps at, uh, as of March of 2014. The, the base study is uh, a new study. It touches the, just the uh, shoreline and the immediate area adjacent to the bay. So there are a few places where uh, you may be impacted twice, but we try to minimize those. If you are in the upper reaches of the uh, watershed of either the Cor de Madeira uh, or the uh, Mill Valley Creek watershed or the Ross Valley uh, Larkspur watershed, those maps are not going to change uh, with the new bay study. It's only if you are adjacent to the bay. Um, my area has never flooded, um, and uh, you know other neighbors have flooded again. And you know, sort of why? Why do I have to buy flood insurance? Because my I've never flooded. And again, I, you know, I know it's a really tough concept, but it really comes down to it's a totally statistically each year is a new year, um, and uh, we have really never seen in the last 30 or 40 years that we've developed, uh, we have not seen the big one, just as you know, those of us in the last, who live here have not seen the earthquake big one, but we know it could happen, it's the same concept. There are indications and records that in 18, uh, 1863, California experienced the big one. Um, there are historical records that show that uh, you could uh, travel uh, virtually up to Redding on a rowboat, uh, you know, well, on a, on a freight liner going in. So, it's a, so um, it, it can happen, and that's the point we want to make. Uh, and, um, you know, it, it, we're lucky enough that it hasn't happened lately, but uh, certainly it can. Uh, uh, let's see, if, if a homeowner, uh, let's see, if a homeowner doesn't live uh, above high tide, uh, where's the flood risk? Again, uh, the, the base flood elevation is computed uh, with our modeling and, and looking at the historical records, looking at the tides, looking at the wind, creating a model that was validated and then applying statistics to it to come up to that 1% annual chance. Do cities uh, and counties carry flood insurance to pay for the roads and facilities that are damaged by a flood? That's a really, really good question. Uh, if, 
your uh, flood, if your fire station or your city hall is located in a FEMA uh, flood zone or one or one percent annual chance special flood hazard area, the city is required to carry flood insurance on city hall or on the fire station. Um, during the time of a disaster, in a federally declared disaster, FEMA has a program called Public Assistance, and it is through that program that we provide assistance to put back things like roads and bridges, and to put them back in the, uh, the way that they were. Uh, but certainly floods are costly for local communities, uh, and it's uh, something to be uh, aware of. Um, there, this is another really great question. Uh, for the past couple of decades, we've been returning land to wetlands riparian landscape. One argument has been that it is uh, to help prevent uh, disastrous flooding. Um, shouldn't that help, uh, uh, you know, create and update the maps? The the um, the topography and the bathymetry uh, were, con were considered in uh, our mapping, and so any of that wetland restoration that raised uh, the, the, the outboard part of the bay m that may have knocked down the waves actually was considered in our calculations. And um, there's some, been some discussions by scientists and uh, 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 local professionals about uh, examining and saying, can we do more of that to ultimately reduce uh, flood risk? There's a lot of science that has to go into it, but there are some discussions that are starting, and I'm optimistic that over the course of the next um, 10 or 15 years, we'll have some progress and make some, some improvements. Um, how do we question our, our evaluation and, um, and why is insurance so expensive? Well, I'm going to leave the expensive one to, to Edie. Um, but the, the one way to kind of look more closely is, again, to contact 1-877-FEMA-MAP, and they can walk you through the process for doing that. And again, uh, how has the bay map changed uh, from Corte Madera Creek and the Ross Valley to the north? So again, there were two studies. Uh, there was the riverine study that covered Corte Madera uh, and uh, the Ross Valley. Those maps went into effective in March. Uh, this new study is just focused on the bay uh, and is a, is a coastal study. And those maps will become effective, as I said, in next year. Explain the 90-day appeal process. Well, again, uh, the 90-day process is that um, if you have better, basically if you have better scientific data, you submit that to your community. Uh, they uh, approve it or make a decision to forward it on to FEMA, and then it gets considered. Um, so that's kind of the appeal process. But you can also provide comments, and uh, if you do so, submit them to your local community, and they can forward to us. Oh, great. Thank you. Um, oh, why don't your maps consider climate change? Um, there's kind of two reasons for that. Um, one, as I mentioned, is that the maps are to be, um, to administer the National Flood Insurance Program, and so they are designed to reflect the conditions as they exist today. Now there is a mechanism for communities to adopt a higher standard, and so there is a way that a community could request what we call future conditions hydrology, so that they adopt maps that are a little more stringent. There's some benefits to doing that to the community in that uh, we have a program called the Community Rating System, and we've forgotten to mention that the last couple nights. For those of you who want to get your flood insurance rates reduced, we have a program called the Community Rating System. And the concept is that the more the community does uh, to get the word out, to have higher building standards, then the more points they get, the more points they get, then they, the more of a discount you get with your flood insurance. 
And off the top of my head, I don't recall, I believe uh, Mill Valley participates, Corte Madeira, part and 15%. So residents of Corte Madeira are enjoying a 15% reduction in their flood insurance rates because uh, the city has um, done some extra work. So uh, that could be something that the community could request, although in doing so, then anytime anyone wanted to build a home, they'd have to elevate their home a little higher. That may not be something the community in general wants to do. Yes, yes. So uh, how does this, that's a really good question. How does this affect the sale of my home if I wish to sell it? Um, so um, you, the lend, uh, uh, real estate, as I understand it, they are required to disclose if you are currently in a high risk flood zone. So they will go to the map uh, that is in effect today and use that as the basis for telling a, a future buyer that they have a high risk zone. Um, I don't know if they look at future uh, maps um, as a rule. Uh, they may or they may not. Um, but um, And there's a question about how does this affect the sale of my home. I think there's a number of things to take into account. Um, it certainly can have an effect on your home. Uh, if, if your neighbor is out of a flood zone and you're in, uh, I'm not going to sugarcoat it. I, you know, it, it can have an effect. The other thing, though, the other th when if you think about the decisions you made when you went to buy your home, um, looking at a FEMA map to decide if it was in a flood zone was probably not the first thing that you thought about. You thought about the schools, you thought about the community, you thought about being part of it, an environment. And um, so there's kind of a mixed bag. Um, all of Almost all of downtown Ross is in a high-risk flood zone. And I don't know about you, but I can't afford to live there. So uh, it probably has some effect, but um, it, it's a mixed bag. Um, the FEMA maps do not seem to take into account the infrastructure improvements like pump stations. Why not? Uh, there's a couple of reasons for that, is that the pump stations in Corte Madeira, um, as I understand them, were designed to about a 50-year event. So they would be overwhelmed and overcome if there was a real, if the big one were to happen. Um, certainly discussions you may wish to have with your local uh, folks are, is about upgrading and um, making them ro more robust so they may qualify for FEMA credit. But the process for doing that is costly, and so there's sort of a decision that you, uh, as citizens, and your city community need to have a conversation about. Um, uh, you may decide that that's something you want to do, but it is costly, and um, and you know it's a, it's it's a discussion that you want to have. Um, Again, kind of the, the flood protection, what are some of the things? It's, it's very difficult to, to uh, create flood protection along the bay. Uh, there are some discussions that are happening, uh, but um, any kind of infrastructure takes a long time to build. It's very costly, um, and there's a lot of nuances that go into it. And so it's a long-term discussion that you want to have with your community, and uh, however you proceed, it, it, I guarantee you that it will be costly. So those are um, all of the, my, the questions sort of aimed at me. I'm gonna give it to Edie. Okay, let's talk about some of the flood insurance questions here. Uh, first question is, what percentage of home loans are federally backed uh, or not? Probably over 90% are federally backed, and I think that would be, that would be fair to say that. Um, the next question is uh, really more building specific and the question revolves around um, a condominium association and the different um, unit owners. And basically the answer to the question is if the condominium association has a master policy for flood that is insufficient enough coverage, then you don't need your own individual policy. But if there's either no coverage by the condo association or it's not 
uh, it's insufficient coverage to meet the lender requirement under the federal law, then the lender will be required to have the unit owner buy a policy to supplement uh, the master policy. The next question is, why can't I self-insure? What is FEMA's position on this vice of these lenders? Um, we don't allow self-insurance. and uh, FEMA doesn't make those rules. Um, the lenders are complying with uh, federal laws that uh, were passed by Congress. Um, so at this point in time, there is no way to uh, self-insure unless you're uh, a state-owned property and it's an approved policy of self-insurance. Uh, but it doesn't apply to uh, residential and commercial uh, businesses. The next question is, what's the future of FEMA flood insurance premiums for primary homeowners? So in the past, the uh, FEMA flood insurance uh, has been based more on classification of your structure. Uh, so we had several different categories of structures and several different categories of rates. And we still have uh, those categories, but now what's happening under the new legislation is that the rates are becoming more building specific. So uh, in other words, we're going to be uh, or we're directed under the legislation to look at the individual building elements and apply a premium based on the flood risk on a building by building basis. So it's going more building by building instead of just a uh, general rate structure. Okay, so the next question is, we own one parcel with one loan. The parcel has two buildings. Why is each building required to have its own policy? That is because under the flood insurance program, if uh, we insure one building per policy, so if you have two buildings on a parcel of land and they're both in the special flood hazard area, your lender's required under the federal law to sh have documentation that you have flood insurance on each building. And the way that our flood insurance is written with through the National Flood Insurance Program, we don't have blanket coverage. Uh, it's one building per policy. So the next question is, if maps won't be final until 2015, why does my bank require the insurance now? Uh, probably because you're already in a high risk area. So I would say uh, if you're already in an, any type of A zone or any type of B zone on the current map and you have a federally backed loan, that's the reason why your lender would be requiring you to have flood insurance. So uh, we can check the maps for you and uh, tell you if you're in one of those A zones or B zones. Next question is, uh, are you talking only about residential parcels? Uh, the, the federal law applies to any federally backed loan, whether it's on a residential or commercial building that's located in a high risk area in any one of those A zones or B zones. What about houseboats that float higher than the water, higher with the water? Well, that's a really good question. Uh, for, from the National Flood Insurance standpoint, they're considered boats, even though lots of them are people's homes, and I wish I had one, but um, we don't insure houseboats. So that's the answer to that question. Um, what is the criteria for premiums uh, for the cost? The flood insurance premiums, um, as I mentioned, are being based more on a house by house basis. What is the flood risk at your house, depending on the age of the building, how risky is the flood zone that you live in, is how much coverage are you or requ uh, required to have on your building, or how much coverage have you asked the, lend uh, the insurance agent for, uh, how much is your deductible, uh, what type of foundation do you have? Is it an elevated foundation on piers and posts? Is it slab on grade? Uh, do you have a basement? 
Um, so there's a number of uh, factors that go into determining the flood insurance premiums. And the rates are, there's a rate book that's updated once or twice annually, or I should say reviewed once or twice annually uh, by the actuaries and underwriters. So theoretically, if you went to 10 different insurance agents and gave them the exact same underwriting criteria, they would all be using the same rate manual or the same rating software, so to speak. They have the same rate chart uh, to establish a premium for your structure because the rates are all federally set. And some of those uh, rates now are subject to uh, the most recent legislation that was passed on March 21st of 2014. The next question is, what happens when FEMA flood insurance becomes unaffordable? It's already at that point and leaps up by 20% a year. Our quote this year was $10,500. So one of the things that this new legislation is doing is not only looking at the rate structure to see where it needs to be reformed, but to also look at affordability and to also have conversations with private industry and see if there's possibility that we can have more private participation by private insurers to offer flood insurance. Uh, so all of those things are ongoing uh, as a result of the new legislation, and we will know more about that um, as we, as it, over the next uh, year or two. So kind of stay tuned on that. We're, we're all looking forward to uh, seeing what will happen there. Could you please explain the need for who needs and benefits from an elevation certificate? We've had an insurance company tell us they won't even quote without it. So an elevation certificate um, it is a document that uh, essentially it, it's used for several purposes, but for flood insurance, it not only, uh, it, it will document the elevation of your lowest floor in relation to the base flood elevation that Kathy was talking about, or the level that they expect it to flood to. So if your uh, lowest floor, for example, is right here, let's say, but the level they're expecting it to flood to is above my head, and I'm just using this as an example, then your lowest floor that you and I walk on and sleep on every day is below the level that they're expecting it to flood to in the big flood. So that means you're quite a bit at risk for flooding and your premium is based on uh, that risk. Now on the converse, uh, if we have just the opposite where the flood level is here and the level that uh, your, your lowest floor is up here, then you're quite a distance above the base flood elevation or the level it's, we're expecting it to flood to, and therefore you're lower at risk of flooding, not to say you're no risk, you're lower risk of flooding, and so your premium is commensurate with uh, that risk. So the elevation certificate, that's how we use it for insurance rating purposes. So if I could, let me get through the rest of the questions for the benefit of those people who wrote them down. And then we'll circle back around, because we'll, we wanna make sure that we get uh, all your questions addressed, and I know there are a number of those. So when will we know about cost, uh, cost of flood insurance? So what we probably need to do is, as since there was new legislation passed in March of this year that is still being evaluated uh, and still being implemented, what we really need to do is uh, provide more detailed information when we have it uh, before the maps become effective in the fall of 2015. Or the other option is your insurance agents uh, will be able to tell you uh, what the options are as we get closer to the effective dates of the new map. Um, right now, that piece of legislation is still being evaluated and implemented, so we don't know uh, with, 
with about the cost of flood insurance. Uh, next question is, our flood insurance rates went up significantly last summer. Can we expect further significant increases one that, once the new maps take effect? So, and this question I would answer the same, that I think we really need to, uh, one of the keys, one of the key items is uh, how the new maps are gonna impact your particular structure. And so tonight, uh, one of the main purposes for being here is to find that out by looking at these maps and, and talking to the folks that are here. Uh, and then again, as we get closer to the fall, we will be able to tell you more specifics about what options and more about the, uh, the cost of the flood insurance, as will your insurance agents. So the next question, there's a, there's a couple of questions on here. Um, what criteria is required to file a claim, i.e. what, what um, scenarios are needed? So flood insurance covers uh, a general and temporary condition of flooding from any source. Uh, the key is that it has to be displaced over two acres or two properties. And that's what differentiates it from a claim that you would make under your standard homeowner's policy. So in other words, if your toilet overflows or your bathtub overflows, what type of a claim is that? Where would you go? You go to your homeowners, right? But if there is a big storm in your area and we have a significant amount of rainfall or let's say uh, one of the main water pipe pipes breaks in your neighborhood and the, the street starts flooding and then it jumps the curb and then it gets to your house and then it goes in your house and you have a flood insurance policy, who covers that then? That's the flood insurance, right? Because it's displaced over two acres or two properties. And so if we have a tsunami that comes in from an earthquake, if we have a levee break because of an earthquake, uh, if we have a dam break, if we have a, uh, a, a main drain clogged up, and it's, dis it's a general and temporary condition of flooding, and uh, it impacts your house and you have a flood insurance policy, you would have flood coverage. Okay, so now there's another related question on here. Uh, what criteria is used to pay a claim? Please confirm whether flood damage to continuous homes, parcels, is required to pay the claim. I think we answered that one. And any other criteria as needed. So the way the, uh, the, way the flood insurance, uh, the claims process works is just like your standard homeowners or your auto insurance. So if you have a flooding, uh, flood damage on your property, what you wanna do is contact your insurance agent. If you have a flood insurance policy, they will assign a claims adjuster to go out and uh, the claims adjuster is going to make a report and document your loss, report it back to uh, the carrier. And one of the things that they're documenting is that it is a general and temporary condition of flooding, uh, like we just talked about. Very good question. Okay, so these are all great. Uh, next one is, we are already experiencing flood due to rising sea levels every month. Kathy, I might need you on this one. Uh, are more low-cost loans uh, to, are more low-cost loans, um, basically, are more, more low-cost loans available uh, with, with this or other types of disasters? Okay, so that, uh, we don't have any, uh, we don't have, we don't get involved in the loan process under the flood insurance program. I don't know if Kathy wants to talk about sea level rise, but um, the question was, I don't know if you have anything to add here. We are already experiencing flood due to rising sea levels every month. And then, uh, 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 I think someone's asking. Are there low-cost loans for uh, doing the slow-moving water 
um, and other disasters? Um, <clears throat> that's a good question. Uh, there are, if there is a major disaster, there is uh, an opportunity to get uh, a low cost loan, uh, but that's not something you really want to have happen. Um, and are there ways to deal with slow moving water? Um, again, that's a kind of a conversation between you and your uh, uh, community. Sir? So I can, I, can, I can elaborate that question. Okay, I okay. okay. So come, come up front and hear it. So I happen to own a houseboat marina that's on Richardson Bay, and the water has risen eight inches in the last 30 years, so we're already experiencing the impacts of sea level rise on a monthly basis, and we have to move our cars every month. It's just like the off-ramp to Mill Valley that floods on a regular basis that you're all familiar with. So from our point of view, this is a slow-moving disaster, just like sand here would happen in New Orleans or anything else. So even though it's not happening all at once, it still impacts us. So I'm wondering if there are FEMA funds available for low-cost loans for what has as much impact to us on an ongoing slow basis as some of these large disasters. That's a good question, and it's a tad complicated. Um, there aren't loans, FEMA loans, uh, for that, but there are uh, pre-disaster mitigation grant funds. So um, they're, they're limited, uh, but there may be, depending on the kind of solution that's being proposed, there may be some uh, mitigation funds. The mitigation funds do pay for things like elevating homes uh, and some of those kinds of things. It's a very complicated, long process, uh, but there, again, it's a kind of a dialogue that I would encourage you to have with your uh, community and your public works director to see if there are things. If, again, it's going to be very challenging, it's going to be very lengthy, and none of these are easy solutions. So I think there's a kind of a general desire to kind of get you out of your seats. We've been going on for uh, an hour. I think uh, there's a few questions that are from Michael Hornick, so I'll give him a few minutes to answer a couple of the questions that you have. And then I think what we'll do uh, is uh, there's a few things I well, I'll turn it over to Michael to answer a few questions, uh, and uh, then we'll get ready to move into break into groups. Actually, <clears throat> I had one question, and I answered the other one in the, the lobby. Uh, this has to do with characteristics of lowest floor as it relates to floor that must be raised to BFE, base flood elevation, <coughs> when you have substantial improvement. So just very quickly, there, there's a, as Kathy explained, there's a little relationship between FEMA, the National Flood Insurance Program, and the city. It's called participating community. And part of that condition is the city has, as part of that arrangement, a floodplain management ordinance. And people very often mistake what the city must ask you to do as FEMA's requirement. It's actually a floodplain management requirement of the city in participation with the National Flood Assurance Program. You keep referring to the city. I imagine there are some people here within the city limits of the Valley and many who are not. So please be more specific. I can't be any more specific than saying community. Okay? That community can be city or it can be county. But what I'm talking about is substantial improvement. It relates to any community in the United States. The rules of substantial improvement are relatively simple. If an evaluation by the community, city, or county, if you reach a 50% threshold, meaning the improvement to the structure at the time of construction is 50% of fair market value. That fair market value is determined by the community. So the question had to do with the requirement of the lowest really the lowest elevated floor, because you need to get that floor that you live on above the base flood elevation. In Mill Valley, the requirement is to get one foot additional above the base flood elevation. So the lowest elevated floor has to go one foot more. That's for reasons of safety, and that was passed by the city council. It may later be a state code, but right now it's the city's code. Marin County, I believe, has a similar uh, free board requirement. And this is all for an extra measure of safety. Is that new construction? Substantial improvement deals with an existing structure that wants to be improved or remodeled. 
Anything less than, by evaluation, less than 50% does not have to abide by the substantial improvement rule of elevation. Less than 50% of fair market value. At the time that you submit a proposal, the city and you go through an appraisal and evaluation. Sometimes it requires an appraisal, certified appraisal from the homeowner to ensure that their value of their improvement is in fact less than 50% of the established fair market value. What about a market condition? Again, if it's improving, that rule applies to commercial entities and to residential facilities. So they would have submitted some documentation to the city to establish whether they're above 50% or below 50%. Well, I want to thank you all very much. We'll take a time to answer questions. Again, uh, my name is Kathy Schaefer. I'm the FEMA engineer responsible for the maps located out of Oakland. Uh, and I am a Marin resident. Uh, that was Michael Hornick, who uh, is responsible for answering your building questions. We had Edie Lohman uh, and Olivia Homalde uh, here this evening. I want to just also kind of draw attention. We have been uh, being videotaped, which is a tad scary, but it's also going to be available uh, on the Marin community uh, site. So if you didn't get enough of this this evening, you can watch it over and over again. Um, so, uh, oh, sir, yes, we have a comment. Do, uh, are the rates um, factoring in some of the cost of New Orleans? Um, uh, no, actually, that from that standpoint, um, the, um, the, the way that it's, it's viewed is that we, we are understanding as a nation that flood risks are um, extraordinarily costly and um, nationwide. And for 40 years, a lot of our data and information was out of date. It was, it was created using technology, the maps, the coastal maps for, for the bay were created using technology that's 30, 40 years old. And so Congress is asking us to update it to provide more accurate uh, information and for the first time, we're actually getting some funding to do that. So it's really part of a process to really get better, more accurate data in the hands of consumers so that they can make some decisions. So with that, I'm gonna go ahead and uh, break us into groups because I know some of you have been sitting for a long time and kind of wanna do your own thing. So in the back, if you want to see your parcel and what it is for you, we have folks in the back who can show you your parcel. I'm going to have Edie, she's going to be up front, so if you have a question regarding your insurance, uh, please come up and talk to Edie. Michael, I'm going to have Michael go over to this side of the room, and uh, if you have a question regarding your building and what it means for you for building, and I'll be in the back to answer any of the questions. I want to thank you all so very much for coming. This is not an easy topic, it's kind of uh, not a lot of fun, and you've been a really terrific audience.